aware that my little mug is going to be in the top right hand corner. Okay, I don't and see it in the window. Here. Now I've tried to fix my slides so that they don't cover. It, my my image won't cover anything. Okay, I, I tell you what, uh, since we got this going, let's just leave this. I won't show the introduction. Hi everyone. Um, sorry, we're a little late. We're getting the slide present presentation ready from Dr. Southerton. Um, let me give it just a brief intro and then we'll turn the time over to uh, Simon. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for attending the 220 Sunstone Digital Symposium Session 352 titled Lifting the Lamanite Curse, How Human Genomics is Exposing Mormon Myths. The audio for this session will be available for purchase at Sunstone after symposium. The video recording of the session will be available in the Whova app for the remainder of 2020. Uh, we're going to ask questions. You can chat the questions uh, in the question and answer. Simon said he'll have time at the end to answer those, about 15, 20 minutes. Um, so please put those in. Uh, if, there is a, if there is a slide you have a particular question on, uh, Simon's uh, requested that I could interrupt him to answer that question, but most of the questions will probably be answered at the end. Um, at Sunstone, we are making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is there's more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space to be better understood. Please support our mission by making a donation and subscribing at sunstone.org. About this presentation, uh, the Prophet Joseph has claimed that the Book of Mormon is a translation of the recovered writings of ancient American prophets, has attracted intense scrutiny from the day it was published. As a consequence, the book's historicity needed to be defended from distractors and promoted to the faithful. Recent whole genome studies on thousands of indigenous Americans and Polynesians has failed to find a trace of ancient Book of Mormon Israelites in the pre-Columbian Americans or in the Pacific. There, are now, there is now an enormous body of scientific evidence that raises serious questions about the history it presents, the racist ideas it contains, its use to erase indigenous culture and the value of persisting with vanishing Lamanite apologetics. I'll now introduce uh, our presenter. Simon Southerton is the author of Losing a Lost Tribe, a Native Americans DNA and the Mormon Church by Signature Books. He recently self-published The Sacred Curse, which presents the challenges to Book of Mormon historicity raised by whole genome research on indigenous Americans and Polynesians. Simon has a BS degree, Bachelor of Science and a PhD from the University of Sydney and led forest molecular genetics research at Cicero. Australian's National Science Agency for about 20 years. He was a co-founder of Gwanda Genomics, a, comp a company delivering forestry molecular marker technology for the international forest industry. Simon served in LDS mission to Melbourne in the 1980s. He is a former bishop, is married to Jane, and they have five children. Simon was excommunicated in August 2005. So Simon, I'll turn the time over to you now for your presentation. Thanks again. Uh, I'll mute myself and uh, turn my video off and the time is now yours. Thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna move my mug over to the right there. Ooh. Oops. Okay, Brett, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm um, just wondering if I can move my face as much as I can off the slides. Otherwise, it's going to cover them. Let's see. You there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. It does look it's, it's covering a bit of the slides, but we'll... Mm. Okay. I'm not going to do any better than that. Okay, we better get going. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for joining me. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to be able to have this opportunity to speak at Sunstone. Um, I'm really pleased with the direction that Sunstone's 
heading and the, the inclusive nature of the the organization now and I'm, uh, it's it's uh, I think it's a very refreshing and, and invigorating for the organization to be embracing um, many other forms of Mormonism apart from the big one and uh, <clears throat> and you know, I think it's a taking a, a positive approach so to start off with I just sort of like to sort of go take hop back to the 1970s when our family joined the church in Australia. We were baptized in 1970. Um, I was 10 years old at the time and we were uh, at the, and during the 1970s, my, um, uh, we, President Kimball was the prophet and we were completely immersed in the, uh, the uh, in the fact that the the Book of Mormon was the true history of the of Native Americans, and it was widely taught and widely believed by the members around me um, that they were uh, the descendants of Lamanites, and this included many um, Indigenous Polynesians that were in the, the wards and branches that we lived that we attended in Sydney. So there were. Yeah, unfortunately, that's going to cut off part of my slides. We're going to have to deal with that. Okay, so it was widely taught in the church, uh, both in the Ensign, um, at General Conference, um, in documentaries and, and films and film strips produced by the church under the authorization of the First Presidency. And even in the Book of Mormon, we had images and pictures that um, depicted um, Native American civilizations in the Americas. So it was, it's just widely believed that the Book of Mormon taught the true history of indigenous peoples. And just as a quick refresher of the Book of Mormon history, um, we have essentially three uh, major groups uh, migrated to the, to the New World, the Jaredites in about 2000 BC, and then two groups at around 600 BC that migrated away from the Middle East. Um, one of these groups, the Mulekites, eventually joined with the Nephites, and then um, for a brief, brief period they were united together, but then the, the Nephites uh, were exterminated in about 421 AD, and then the, the, just the Lamanites uh, survived. So the Book of Mormon was written to the Lamanites. Um, that was the, the general... Uh, purpose of the Book of Mormon was to restore them to the truth that they um, were the descendants of the Jews and so it was really their history <clears throat> and there's absolutely no doubt that Joseph Smith considered um, the Aboriginal inhabitants of the Americas to be uh, descended from uh, the Lamanites. This is evidence from both his own history, his own recorded history. Um, in the Doctrine and Covenants, there are numerous uh, references to the, uh, the Lamanites that lived um, to the west of where the saints were establishing themselves and missionaries were sent uh, frequently out on their, um, on their missions to preach to the Lamanites. Um, and he also, when he was communicating with the press, um, he he simply just referred to the, the history in the Book of Mormon as the um, as literal history of the uh, colonization of the uh, of the New World. So there's little doubt that Joseph Smith believed it was a history about uh, um, all of the uh, inhabitants of the Americas. But there are very striking similarities between. I think what I might do is occasionally move my face when I'm in the way. Um, but there are striking parallels between the, uh, the mound builder myth and the central plot of the Book of Mormon. Now, the mound builder myth was widely, a widely held belief uh, amongst uh, 19th century Americans as they were uh, colonizing the uh, North America. They were moving across the Appalachian Mountains into the Ohio and Mississippi valleys, and they would frequently encounter 
very large mounds and there were many mounds around uh, Joseph Smith's family, where, where Joseph Smith's family lived. And digging in the mounds and finding buried treasure in the mounds was a, was a common pastime for people in the area. So, but this quote here is quite interesting because it, it comes directly out of view of the Hebrews, which um, is, is thought to have uh, provided pretty much, um, I wouldn't even call it a parallel, but pretty much the plot for the Book of Mormon, um, where you have these uh, civilized tribes come to the America, Americas, then you have, um, they split apart, one becomes a, hunt, a hunting and a savage tribe, and then um, they have lots and lots of wars, and then the, the savage tribe wipes out the, uh, the more civilized group. Um, it wasn't until later in the, uh, the 19th century that the Smithsonian and other institutions took a very uh, scientific approach to excavating the mounds, and they discovered um, quite clearly that, uh, um, that these mounds were uh, the product of the indigenous people that were living um, um, that the uh, North Americans were encountering as they were migrating west. <clears throat> and indigenous folk were, um, had these practices where they would, um, when they buried the dead, that they would, uh, they would exhume their bodies and then they would bury them in larger mounds. And this was a common practice. Um, <clears throat> So the, the mound builder myth certainly played a, a significant role in, in inspiring the, the development of the, the Lamanite myth. But the, the Lamanite myth expanded even further when, um, when uh, President Kimball declared in 1975 that the, the Lamanites, that the Polynesians in the Pacific were the descendants of the Lamanites. So interestingly, Joseph Smith made no recorded comments about the Lamanites. Uh, about the Polynesians uh, linked to the Lamanites. But early missionaries, um, Addison Pratt and his wife Louisa were among the early missionaries that were teaching in the Pacific and they've, they, um, they found that the Polynesians were much more receptive to the message. And so it wasn't long uh, when Addison returned to, to Salt Lake and then he uh, interacted with Brigham Young and there were other um, other missionaries interacted with Brigham Young. He became, he then declared in, in 19, sorry, 1858 that uh, they were the House of Israel. Um, but curiously, uh, most Polynesians regard the Hagoth to be their direct ancestor. And, uh, but it's, it's actually, um, quite clear in the Book of Mormon that, that Hagoth and the people that accompanied him in the boats that they sailed off in uh, were Nephites. So uh, but that's the beauty of myths. They don't need to make any sense at all. Um, one thing that I was very, uh, we were exposed to an awful lot in Australia because we had so many Polynesians around us in the church um, was the uh, the, the voyages of Thor Heyerdahl and the Kontiki. Now, at the time, we regarded Thor Heyerdahl as a scientist and the great discoverer of, of um, uh, how migrations took place in, in ancient times. Um, but he was more of an adventurer than a scientist. And, uh, but he was also a hyper-diffusionist, somebody that believes that uh, essentially, most of the world's cultures were were seeded by um, people and their cultures that were developed in the Middle East. So he was convinced that that um, people from the Middle East had migrated to the Americas, and then the, then they um, migrated further uh, back into the Pacific. So he was convinced that uh, South Americans, Indians, had colonised the Pacific. And the work of Thor, Thor Heyerdahl really cemented the, uh, the Lamanite myth amongst Polynesian members of the church. It was widely publicized even in general conference and um, Polynesian libraries in, Australia, in the Pacific are just, church libraries this is, are filled with, um, with his 
the books and the films that he produced. Okay, I'm having a real problem with my face. Let's get it over there. So what I'd like to do now is just turn to um, the population genetics. And for those of you who are familiar with my book, Losing a Lost Tribe, it dealt uh, exclusively with mitochondrial DNA. And it's a much less powerful DNA technology for tracing ancestry. I don't know of any of you who, if, for those of you who have had your um, family history or your DNA analyzed and your mitochondrial DNA, you've learned your mitochondrial DNA lineage. Um, it's not terribly informative. Um, however, genomic DNA is, is far more powerful and, and I want to introduce you to the, to the, to the work that's been done um, over the last 10 years on the genomic DNA front. Okay. Okay, just as a quick summary, uh, introduction to, or overview of uh, human DNA, uh, before we get into the uh, genealogy research that's been done with DNA. Um, there, I won't say too much about Y chromosome DNA. Um, it's not been used as much for uh, hu uh, human ancestry studies. Mitochondrial DNA was much easier to work with and much cheaper to work with. So. Um, much more work was done on the mitochondrial DNA. But the, the fundamental difference between genomic DNA and mitochondrial DNA, firstly, the amount of information in our genome or our genome, genomic DNA is just enormous uh, compared to mitochondrial DNA. If you were to compare a, a 500 page novel to our genome, then mitochondrial DNA would barely occupy the first word in the book. It's just an enormous amount of information in the genomic DNA which until about 2007 was almost inaccessible. So, but technology has moved on considerably and, we, and, and now uh, we can now mine the genomic DNA for the information it contains. So mitochondrial DNA has, a, has quite a distinct, a distinctly different pattern of inheritance. We inherit our genomic DNA as rearrangements from our father and mother, but our mitochondrial DNA we inherit down the maternal lines. And that's because it's not in the nucleus. If you look in the cell here, the mitochondria are outside of the nucleus. And if you imagine this cell is a, an egg cell, the sperm comes in, fertilizes the nucleus, and the DNA, the genomic DNA of the sperm is passed into the nucleus. If that cell then goes on to grow, then it's the mitochondria from the mother, the egg cell that are passed onto the offspring. So. So sons and daughters are, will always have the mitochondrial DNA lineage of the mother. So all of the information that's used for DNA genealogy is, is contained in markers. So a DNA marker is simply a difference between two D DNA strands. And that can be between the two chromosomes that we all possess for each of the 22 chromosomes in the genome, or it can be a a point mutation, a point difference in our mitochondrial DNA compared to somebody else. And down, you, down the bottom, you can see that there are just enormous numbers of markers in the genome uh, that can be used for genealogy. And uh, there's about 20 to 30 markers in the mitochondrial DNA that can be used. So if we look at um, tracing our ancestry using the mitochondrial line, you can see here that it just doesn't reveal anything about most of our great grandparents going, sorry, going back just um, four generations. So it, it just, you're only, if you're tracing mitochondrial DNA, you're only seeing one individual out of eight going back to your great uh, grandparents. If you go back 10 generations, it's only one individual out of about a thousand. So it's so it's not it doesn't contain nearly as much information. So what's um, however it has still been extremely useful. Um, so what this uh, diagram illustrates um, how the markers have been used to distinguish different 
mitochondrial lineages throughout the world. So each branch point here is essentially a marker point where uh, a marker has arisen and you then get a new branch. And you can see that the most, the deepest branches um, occur in Africa and the shallowest branches are throughout uh, Eurasia. So the mitochondrial lineages that are common amongst Native Americans are the A, B, C, D and X lineage. Um, and the reason that the, they have the A, B, C and D is that uh, the very first mitochondrial lineages that were described were uh, ones among Native Americans and Asians. But already you'll see that there's one of the limitations of mitochondrial DNA, and that is that the Polynesians have a B lineage as well. Um, so Native Americans and Polynesians have been separated from, for many thousands of years, uh, genetically quite distinct, um, but, uh, they all, but they both contain the B lineage. So there's, there's an awful lot of variation within each one of these groups. So I'll say a little bit about, more about these lineages later on. Um, this is a map that illustrates the distribution of lineage H. If we go back to that previous slide, lineage H over here is a Eurasian lineage. Uh, it's more common in Europe. And in, I had my DNA done about, uh, analyzed about four or five years ago. And it turns out that I have the H lineage. But if you look here at the distribution of the H lineage in Europe, you can see it's a vast area of Northwestern Europe, where the H lineage is very common. Um, so it, it doesn't give a very uh, tight uh, prediction of ancestral origins, just knowing what your, your mitochondrial DNA lineage is. <clears throat> if we then turn our attention to mitochondrial DNA, you can see that there's much more information that's carried in the mitochondrial, sorry, sorry, if you turn to genomic DNA, you can see there's this vast amounts of information that it can reveal because it, it, it exposes, uh, it allows us to trace pretty much our entire ancestry. Um, another important thing that occurs and it's illustrated in this diagram is that each generation, um, the chromosomes recombine. So when uh, a parent passes on a chromosome to their, their chromosomes to their children, each one of the 22 chromosomes that they pass on will carry segments of uh, both their parents. So this process of recombination occurs every generation and it has the effect of uh, chopping up the, uh, the segments of the chromosomes into shorter and shorter chunks from each of in each generation. So you can see here this, this red chromosome here, it's a full chromosome that's um, passed on, but then it gets cut and cut again and cut again in each succeeding generation. And this is a very useful feature of genomic patterns of DNA inheritance that is, has been exploited by scientists to determine how long ago events have taken place in a, in a family history. So a very common way of illustrating uh, genomic DNA is to just to simplify the vast amounts of information that it contains is to just illustrate um, via a pie chart where proportions of your DNA have come from and, and people who've had their DNA analyzed might um, would have seen something similar to this. Um, and this is, an act is actual data from my own family history. And I just wanted to run through my own um, family history just to illustrate uh, the power of genomic uh, DNA analysis. So the eight dots you can see there um, are my eight uh, great grandparents where they were born. Oh, and the blue ones from my father's side of the family and the pink from my mother's. And they're quite well separated and many of my ancestors come from sort of outlying regions of the United Kingdom. Now, when um, 
I analysed the data that came back from the company, I was able to assign pretty much very close to 50% of my DNA to, to the, uh, the four um, great-grandparents on my mother's side. But I had a lot of trouble assigning, I couldn't assign more than about 35% uh, to the UK. It turns out that I have about 12.5% of my genome comes from Europe, which is really interesting because I don't have European ancestry in my paper genealogy. Uh, so it appears that about almost certain that one of my great grandparents isn't really my great grandparents. So one of my great grandfathers on my father's side, and it turns out that it's more than likely um, my great grandfather named Robert Southerton. So it may be that my Southerton Y chromosome came from Germany. Um, and that's quite interesting because when I looked at my Y chromosome, it's more common, it it's, occurs at twice the frequency in Germany as it does in the United Kingdom. So it's quite possible that my uh, great grandmother may have been pregnant before uh, marrying my great grandfather. But we don't know what happened, but it's, uh, but it's interesting how the genomic DNA was able to reveal at quite uh, quite accurately where uh, my DNA came from within the United Kingdom. And that's because they've got a very powerful database with uh, thousands of uh, individuals who have, um, have very confirmed ancestry in um, parts of the UK that is, has formed a database. So if you've, if you've got a very solid database, you can then predict um, where quite accurately where the DNA comes from. So another thing I should point out is you don't ex um, each grandparent on average would contribute sorry each great grandparent on average would contribute about twelve and a half percent of my uh, DNA, but that's an average. It doesn't always isn't always the case. So that's why we would some are below twelve and a half percent and some are above twelve and a half percent. So as I mentioned earlier, the um, recombination between DNA is a very uh, useful feature because it allows scientists to determine uh, when admixture events have occurred in the past. So if you have two, say, two parents that come from different populations with a whole range of distinctive markers on them, when they uh, when they have offspring, they pass on their chromosomes, but in each succeeding generation, these chromosomal chunks derived from each of the parent populations will be broken down. So after many generations, you'll see small, much smaller and smaller chunks of chromosome can be assigned to the ancestral populations. And how small those chunks get to is uh, can be correlated with time. So you can work back, you can estimate when the admixture event took place um, by looking at the, the, the lengths of the, the chromosomal chunks. So this is, um, this feature has been used quite a lot in uh, recent genomic studies of Native Americans. <clears throat> so this, this is what the uh, genomic data looks like when you look at the chromosomes of an individual. So this is, uh, a process called chromosome painting, which is um, which has been used to determine the ancestry of the chromosomes in one particular individual. So this is data from one person, and it's a person who had a, an English parent, and that's why you can see in every single one of their 22 chromosomes, one of the chromosomes is entirely red. So that chromosome came from parent A, uh, B. But uh, in this example, uh, the other chromosome came from a parent that had a little bit of Swedish ancestry. And it's the average length of, this, of these chunks will tell us roughly how long ago that Swedish ancestry entered into this family. 
into this individual. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do now is just to run through the, some of the data on Native Americans. Then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Polynesians. And I'll, 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 first off, I'll talk a little bit about the mitochondrial DNA analysis because it's still, um, it is still valuable information. It was the earliest information and it was sufficient information to, to really clearly um, identify the origins of um, both of these groups. But it, it has been, uh, there's been some amazing discoveries in just the last year that have added much more insight into the, um, into the sort of finer details of um, migration into both the Pacific and into the Americas. <clears throat> Um, I might skip, well, I put this slide in because it's a, a very useful um, illustration of how, um, of, I guess, the, the, the uniqueness of the New World and the Pacific in terms of uh, the history of human migration. The biggest barrier to, to human migration into the Americas uh, and into the northern parts of Eurasia has always been the, the ice, the presence of ice. So the, um, as the glaciers have moved down, it's, it's, made a, it's, it's been very challenging for humans to migrate through it. Um, and so it's been an effective barrier to migration. Um, but for a long time, it's been thought that Native Americans uh, migrated uh, after the, the, into the New World after the last glacial maximum. Um, but uh, there's been some very interesting discoveries this year that suggest that may not be the case. They may have actually entered the Americas earlier. Um, but uh, another area where humans have very recently colonized is the Pacific. And this, these lines here illustrate the migrations, the, uh, the amazing migrations of the Polynesians just within the last uh, few thousand years, even over to Madagascar. Um, <clears throat> so they're, they're very different, different in their timing and um, the, uh, the colonization of the Americas and the, and the Pacific. So it's been known for a long time that um, uh, indigenous Americans uh, have Siberian ancestors. You only have to look at a Siberian and you can see very clear, very striking similarities between them and Native Americans. And it appears from DNA and archaeological evidence that the, the ancestors of in, uh, indigenous Americans migrated from Lake, around Lake Baikal, which is a very large freshwater lake in central Siberia. Um, which is where humans have colonized for probably the last 40 to 50,000 years. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, the Ice Age was considered to be a large barrier to human migration. Um, however, it did, uh, it, did make, um, it did make it possible for humans to colonize to, to actually walk into the Americas, because during the Ice Age, large volumes of, of ice were trapped in the polar caps and in large glaciers over much of um, North America and Eurasia, and that lowered the sea levels. And because of the ocean currents, there, were, there was a region called Beringia between Alaska and Siberia that um, was exposed during the Ice Age and that enabled um, Siberians to migrate into this region um, about 20,000 years ago. But then as the ice, uh, the Ice Age came to an end, sea levels rose and that, um, so now we have that region is, is uh, about 90 metres underwater. So the, 
many, for many years, it was believed that um, the first Americans were Clovis, the Clovis people. And the, the reason for that is that there were, there were just literally tens of thousands of Clovis spear points found all over North America. So each one of these dots on this graph illustrates points where Clovis spear points have been found. Uh, and as you can see, there's just huge numbers uh, scattered all the way across uh, North America, particularly over in the east. And these very distinctive Clovis spear points, you can see here, um, had, a, I guess, a very powerful impact on scientists. So they were, so they, um, for, for a long period of time, the Clovis were believed to be the first Americans. But there were, there became, there was sort of growing pressure uh, at around about the, the turn of the century as the DNA evidence started to accumulate, it became quite clear that the, uh, the amount of DNA ver variation that occurred in Native Americans and the, uh, and the timing of its entry into the Americas, it, the, all the evidence pointed it to being much earlier than 13,000 years ago. And this is a, a picture that I drew for a paper, that I, a, a chapter that I wrote for um, the global history of uh, human migration several years ago. And this picture summarized what was known at, from the DNA evidence. This is what DNA evidence suggested. Um, it was increasingly becoming clear that uh, the earliest colonization um, occurred around about 19,000 years ago. So, so that, that created quite a problem because the, the Clovis culture was believed to have entered through an ice-free corridor that opened up about 13,000 years ago. Um, but as scientists, um, I, I guess the, the DNA evidence produced this pressure to look harder to see if there was evidence of earlier migrations. And there's been some amazing research in the last couple of years that's just, that has really revealed um, very clear evidence that humans were uh, in North America about 16,000 years ago. And just two weeks ago, um, they found evidence of uh, humans occupying caves in, in Mexico as early as 30,000 years ago. Now this is a very um, striking discovery and a very uh, momentous discovery, this one here in Mexico, because what it suggests is that humans entered the Americas um, before the last ice age. So, um, and a further piece of the puzzle, um, that suggests they were not connected with the Clovis culture is that the stone spear points that they've uncovered um, are quite clearly different to the, to the, um, here we go back to the slide on the Clovis. You can see these are very sophisticated uh, spear points. Um, and these are a much, um, much simpler uh, spear point that, uh, or arrowhead that's been identified here. So there's, gro there's growing evidence that Native Americans um, were present in the, in the Americas much earlier than we originally thought. So if we look at the mitochondrial DNA of Native Americans, it's and, and considerable amount of re research has been done now, about 16,000 individuals have been screened from numerous tribes across the Americas. And about 99% of them have an, a lineage, either the A, B, C, D, or X lineage that's, that's found in Asia. A very small proportion, one or 2% of Native American mitochondrial DNA lineages are either European or African. If we look now at pre-Columbian individuals, so this is work done on about 12, over 12,000 um, ancient remains. So these are, these are people that, uh, that lived over uh, 
200 years ago, three or four, 400 years ago, that had no contact with Europeans or Africans since Columbus. Um, most of these are uh, individuals that are probably 500 to 1,000 years, uh, lived 500 to 1,000 years ago. We find that all of their lineages are Asian lineages. So the other thing that can be done with mitochondrial DNA is to look at the variation within each of the, the lineage groups or, hap or haplogroups. And several groups have looked at um, this sort of data and determined and estimated how long ago uh, these lineages existed. And it's, it's in the vicinity of 18 to 20,000 years ago that the first individuals, the, so all Native Americans descend from an individual that lived um, with that lineage, descend from an individual that lived about that, that long ago. So these would have been individuals that lived in uh, Beringia about 20,000 years ago. <clears throat> if we turn now to genomic DNA, uh, this has been now been used on, to look at uh, large numbers of uh, individuals, na uh, Latin American individuals. So these are people that have both uh, Latin American and uh, indigenous ancestry. Uh, and in this particular research, the scientists were looking to determine where, where their ancestry, where their admixed ancestry came from. And you can see quite clearly here. So first of all, the scientists analyzed DNA from European countries to determine markers that were specific to those countries so they could determine um, where this ancestry, this ancestry occurs or this admixture occurs in, South American populations. Uh, and then they analyzed the DNA of, of thousands of indigenous Latin Americans or Latin American individuals. So each one of these little tiny pie charts that you can hardly see um, is an individual or the location. Of, so it's, it's where, where a person was born is its geographical position. And the color of these in these pie charts illustrates where the, the admixed DNA came from. In, in Europe. And of course, the first thing that stands out quite clearly is that this lines up very well with the historical record. So all the way down the west coast of South America, you have large amounts of Spanish and poor, uh, Spanish DNA. So the red being northern Spanish and the orange southern Spanish. And over in Brazil, very large amounts of Portuguese DNA and also Italian DNA. <clears throat> what scientists have also found in this study of uh, six and a half thousand Latin Americans was that a small proportion of the, the DNA in Latin Americans, um, a small proportion of the European DNA uh, is actually derived from the Middle East. Um, so either Eastern or Southern Mediterranean. And a proportion of that, about half of that DNA is, is, is most similar to Sephardic DNA. Sephardic being the branch of, uh, uh, of, the, the, of uh, the Jews that uh, migrated around the Mediterranean as opposed to the Ashkenazi that migrated into the, to the Rhineland in Central Europe. So, and again, here you can see an interesting pattern here. The, the vast majority of the Sephardic um, DNA that we're seeing in individuals is uh, in countries that had a very high proportion of Spanish DNA and hardly any Sephardic DNA over in uh, Eastern South America. So scientists were interested to determine when this Sephardic DNA arrived in South America. And so they did the tract analysis on the Spanish DNA, the Sephardic DNA, the Italian DNA, and the North European DNA. Uh, 
and they were able to determine that the, the Sephardic DNA arrived in the Americas at the same time as the Spanish DNA. Um, so the Sephardic DNA is almost certainly derived from uh, a group called, who they term the uh, Converso Jews. So when the Jews migrated out of um, the Middle East in the fourth and fifth and sixth centuries um, into Spain, they were highly persecuted um, and uh, quite a few of them um, sort of converted to Christianity in order to avoid persecution. And it's more than likely that, uh, so that um, they also were quite keen to, to move away from Spain when the opportunities arose in the, in the Americas. So, but here it, it looks quite clear that the Sephardic DNA um, that's present in South American populations came from um, the uh, Converso Jews that came on uh, the Spanish galleons with the migrating Spaniards in, uh, in, the, in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, okay. Genomic DNA has also revealed some very interesting secrets just within the last few years in terms of more distant ancestors amongst Indigenous Americans. This study was published in 2015. So each dot here represents a modern day individual whose entire genome was screened with about 500,000 markers. And then these individuals were compared with each other and scientists identified that there was a tiny proportion of DNA amongst several South American populations that was similar to DNA found in Australian Aboriginals and the Ong, which is a very ancient group um, that were almost, that are very closely related to Australian Aboriginals. Um, so as, as uh, the first Australasians migrated out of Africa and down through India, um, they would have traveled through here, this, this region here. So, but it's only a very tiny proportion of DNA. So this, this heat map here illustrates um, the proportions of DNA from um, Australasians that's present in these South American populations. So at the, at the peak here, it's only about 2%. So most of them, it's much less than 1%. It's a very tiny portion of their DNA um, has came from Australian Aboriginals which begs the question where it came from. And, and I, I, my personal opinion is that this is most likely to be the DNA of the, the people that were occupying that Mexican cave 30,000 years ago. And when the wave of uh, Clovis and other Native Americans came down along the coast and they migrated south into South America, they just mixed with these people. Um, so I suspect that's where this Australasian DNA came from. Uh, so it was the DNA of the very earliest migrants into the, into the new world. But there are also other ancient ancestors that have been found amongst uh, in, in the ancestry of indigenous Americans. That's uh, Neanderthals and uh, Denisovans. Um, most of you have probably heard about the fact that we many of us have Neanderth very small proportions of Neanderthal DNA, and that's the case with Indigenous Americans. Um, but they also there is another uh, ancestor that um, ancient group called the Denisovans that occupied uh, parts of Eastern Asia, and very small traces of Denisovan DNA have been found in in several Indigenous groups in the Americas. But now turn our attention to the Polynesians. And here it's quite a different story. Because the migrations into the Pacific were fairly recent, um, we have fairly strong uh, linguistic connections between Polynesian groups and um, their ancestors in island Southeast Asia, 
uh, going through into the Philippines and Taiwan. So for, for many years, it's been suspected that the, the ancestors of the Polynesians were uh, the Taiwanese and Filipinos. Um, but uh, DNA has shed uh, much more light on this over the last few years. So this is some work that I um, published in Losing Lost Tribe. This is the uh, mitochondrial DNA analysis that was done on in, um, Polynesians. And as I mentioned earlier, they have a B lineage, very much like American Indians have a B lineage, but they're quite unrelated. So there are additional uh, markers that occur in Polynesian B lineages that are not present in um, Indigenous Americans. Um, and you can see here the, uh, just how far the Polynesian B lineage has been spread around the world. So you can even find it over in Madagascar. So a small proportion of the Madagascar population is descended from Polynesians. So they were just amazingly skilled navigators and travelled over vast, vast differences and <coughs> vast distances. So <coughs> so if we turn our attention to the genomic DNA, of, um, it's been able to reveal uh, quite clearly the links and the uh, relatedness of Polynesians to other groups, particularly the Filipinos um, in, in, living, in current populations today, but also in other places in Southeast Asia. But what uh, scientists have discovered is a very interesting difference between the older Polynesian genomes, here a 3,000 year old Polynesian genome and a, a present day Polynesian. So present day Polynesians have about 17% of essentially Australasian DNA. So it's DNA from New, New Guinea and Melanesia. Um, however, in, when they analysed the DNA of a 3,000 year old uh, Polynesian in Tonga, they found no New Guinea DNA. So there's no Australasian DNA present in the first Polynesians. So what it appears to have happened is Melanesian DNA has entered Polynesians after they'd migrated out into the Pacific. And I'll show that in the, the next few slides. So we look at the early colonization of the Pacific, Australia, 40,000 years ago, Australia was colonized. Um, Sahul is the landmass. That's the name of the landmass encompassing Papua New Guinea and Australia. And humans had reached uh, the Solomon Islands by f uh, about 30,000 years ago. Then beginning 30,000, sorry, 3,000 years ago, the Polynesians uh, migrated out of Taiwan through the Philippines and then straight out into the Pacific. So they colonized briefly islands here, New Island in uh, Papua New Guinea, but then they colonized uh, Vanuatu, Fiji and Tonga about 3,000 years ago. And this uh, depicts the sort of craft that they had. They built these um, very large outrigger canoes, double hull canoes that were extremely stable, um, they were tremendous navigators. And uh, these skills enabled them to colonize very, to travel very large distances. If we look at more recent colonization of the Pacific, um, as the genomic DNA suggested, the Melanesians, there was contact between uh, Polynesian groups in the Fiji and Samoa and Tonga and Melanesia. So, uh, the, so Melanesian DNA, DNA entered the, their Polynesian genomes about 2000 years ago. Um, about 1200 years ago, Polynesians had reached Polynesia, so French Polynesia over in the east. And then within the space of a, only a few hundred years, they scattered in all directions, very large um, migration events. Um, and they travel over very large distances to colonize most of the rest, uh, the rest of Polynesia. To give you an idea of the scale of these journeys and how, um, how well equipped they were and how skillful they were, the migration to New Zealand is believed to have taken place several times. So they sailed from French Polynesia to New Zealand and back again 
and then back to New Zealand. So it was, there were several migrations that occurred. The distance here is 4,000 kilometers between um, New Zealand and French Polynesia. So these were highly skilled uh, sailors using the, scar the, the, the currents, uh, the winds, the clouds, the stars to navigate. Uh, so they, they really knew where they were going um, and uh, were remarkable colonizers. But a very fascinating uh, piece of research was published only a couple of months ago, which shed even further light on the origin of, um, uh, sorry, on Polynesian ancestry. <clears throat> and this, so this, um, in this study, Inides analyzed the genomes of several Polynesians and also uh, several groups along the western coast of the Americas. And they used this tract analysis to identify when the DNA arrived in the, in, in the Pacific. So they found clear evidence that the Xenu of Colombia arrived Xenu DNA arrived in French Polynesia about 800 years ago. That DNA was then spread to other islands in French Polynesia over quite a large distance, and some even ended up in Easter Island. Um, and they also found that there was Puenchi DNA in Easter Islanders. Now, but this DNA arrived only in the last 140 years. So this DNA, the Puenchi DNA, almost certainly arrived with. Um, Chileans in modern times, in the modern era. But this, the Xenu DNA uh, clearly arrived in the Pacific um, about 800 years ago. Um, in my view, it's more than likely, I think it's far less likely that this was the result of South Americans sailing into the Pacific. Given that the Polynesians had colonized such a vast area, I think it's far more likely that Polynesians reached South America and then came back and they brought back um, Native Americans with them into the, into the Pacific. And I'll talk a little bit about that a bit more later on. So this is um, actually an illustration of a single individual from Easter Island that had Xenu ancestry, And this shows you what their chromosomes look like. So this individual clearly had a European uh, one European parent, and you can see the small chunks of Xenu uh, DNA present on the chromosome of their Polynesian parent. And the size of these indicates just how old it is. So it's, um, if it had been a very recent introduction, these chunks would have been enormous, would have been much, much larger. Um, <clears throat> so that was a really interesting piece of uh, interesting discovery that was made in just the last few months. Um, so there have been other minor pre-Columbian contacts that I wanted to just briefly mention. Um, the Polynesians reached California. It's likely that the Polynesians reached California about 800 years ago or 1200 years ago, the, um, because they have found archeological evidence for in, in California. It's also like we, we know for a fact that the, the Vikings reached uh, North America uh, in Eastern Canada in a place called Vinland. Um, and of course we have the, the Xenu DNA being present in, in French Polynesia. So these are all fairly minor contacts. Now some may have be aware of the, the idea that the sweet potato is evidence of North, sorry, South Americans colonizing the Pacific it's more than likely the, the DNA evidence suggests that um, Polynesian sweet potatoes are quite distantly related to um, South American sweet potatoes. In fact, they share a common ancestor about 100,000 years ago. What that suggests is that the sweet potato in the Pacific was present before humans um, came anywhere near the Americas or the Pacific. <coughs> So what I'd like to do is just very quickly run through uh, some of the limited geography apologetics that I've encountered um, since I've become aware of the, the DNA evidence. Um, and this is a, 
because the I guess the the point I wanted to I want to make is that the LDS scholars have known for some time, well before the DNA came along, that there was little evidence that uh, Israelites had um, colonised the Americas before Columbus. And when I came, I was quite taken when I um, came across some talks that were given at a BYU roundtable in 1969. And in many ways, this this talk sparked the beginning of modern day LDS apologetics, Book of Mormon apologetics. In the opening uh, talk, D. Green uh, admits that the research in uh, South American research, sorry, uh, uh, research in the Americas that the church had done and other scholars had done had failed to find any evidence of um, a Middle Eastern presence or influence in the Americas. There's just clearly no archaeological evidence. However, at the end of the talk, John Sorensen then charts the direction of Mormon apologetics. So because there is no hard evidence, no hard archaeological evidence, he then uh, focuses his research on parallels. And he talks about 200 parallels that he's identified between the Middle East and Mesoamerica, and Mesoamerica and concludes that we can no longer the, the historical claim of the cultural independence of the two areas from each other uh, it, um, so no historical claim of the cultural independence of the two areas from each other is credible in other words he's completely convinced that because of the similarities that he's identified uh, that both that um, Mesoamerican cultures were connected uh, to the Middle East and that's pretty much the way um, apologetics has has um, continued to this day this obsession with looking for cultural parallels um, when John Sorensen published his magnum opus in 2011 which summarized pretty much his entire life work he'd found 420 parallels uh, between Mesoamerican cultures and uh, the Middle East um, Interestingly, John Sorensen served a mission in the Pacific at the time that Heyerdahl's voyage was taken place, took place in 1947. Um, and he became pretty much a rusted on hyper diffusionist. So he was completely convinced that the Polynesian cultures came from the Middle East via the Americas. Um, but he also became uh, what I refer to as a parallelomaniac. He just completely obsessed with similarities between the two cultures. Um, but this methodology, there is an extremely weak methodology, even LDS apologists who have published research on the um, limited geography uh, believe that this approach is fundamentally flawed. If you have a fixed conclusion that uh, the Book of Mormon is a true history uh, and you take this uh, parallel mania approach, you will only see parallels. You will only see evidence that supports your views. So what, just briefly uh, running through what the Meso, sorry, the Mesoamerican limited geography is, it's locate, it locates all of the events in the Book of Mormon in Central America. Um, the narrow neck of land is the Isthmus of uh, Tuantepec and the, the Book of Mormon lands are to the east and south of the narrow neck of land. Um, and if we look at the, some of the cultures that exist in this area, um, the two major cultures, uh, Mesoamerican cultures that were present in this area are the Olmec, um, and they were, um, I guess, the more, the more ancient culture, and the, the Maya. So the, the Olmec occupied the, the northern coast of uh, southern Mexico, Whereas the Guatemala, sorry, the um, the Maya occupied the highlands of Guatemala and southern Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula. So, the limited geography apologists have focused all of their attention on the Olmec and the Maya, um, and the the, la the this is largely because they these they. Uh, 
these cultures live uh, flourished at roughly the right time for the Book of Mormon uh, civilizations. However, they don't match terribly well because the the peak of the Mayan civilization is is mostly after the Book of Mormon period, um, and this is when the the Nephite civilization was uh, destroyed. Um, and both the Maya and the Olmec, they were they had a, a very long formative period. So the cities that are present in the classic Maya existed for many hundreds, if not thousands of years before they, they became quite large um, and archeologically more visible because they had stone buildings. So, um, so simplistically the uh, LDS apologists have, have considered the Olmec, oops, have considered the Olmec to be um, parallel with the Jaredites and the Mayans to be, to be the equivalent or the parallel civilization to the Nephites. And the reason, there is a clear reason why the Maya, they've focused their attention on the Maya. And that's because there are three criteria that they meet that are essential for the Book of Mormon civilizations. Um, the most important one is that they have written language. Um, but they also built uh, very large cities and they existed about the right period of time. There's, there really is no other alternative in the, in the new world. So that's why they focused their attention on the Maya. But some of the more recent apologetics um, I've found extremely troubling. Um, this in a DVD produced by uh, Brigham Young University in 2007, Journey of Faith to the New World, um, John Sorensen makes some very, very disturbing claims about uh, the rise of the Mayan civilization. Uh, he pretty much state, states that the Mayan civilization was basically kicked into uh, existence by the introduction of the more sophisticated technology and uh, cultural practices of the Nephites. Um, and this is, it's just staggering that this still goes on because there's absolutely no connection at all between the mines and, and, uh, and in, in Middle Eastern cultures, none whatsoever. Uh, and this is just racist. And this needs to be, uh, they just need to stop uh, saying things like this. It's very sad to see an indigenous Mesoamerican completely sucked in by the these uh, North American white man's myths. Um, really sad to see that he can't, he now believes as well that a Middle Eastern culture kicked his uh, ancestors civilization into existence when there's absolutely no connection. If we look closely at the Maya, there's been a lot of DNA work done on them and there's clearly absolutely no connection between them and the Middle East. So um, if we look at the mitochondrial DNA, there's a very tiny fraction of the Mayan. Uh, only one individual out of 633 was found to have a European lineage. You could consider this a candidate Lamanite. Um, but if we look very closely at the mitochondrial DNA, okay, if we assume that this one individual is a potential Lamanite, that's only one hundred, only fifth, just over fifteen hundred per million um, potential Lamanites. But the genomic DNA, if we look closely at the genomic DNA, it tells us that the vast majority of the European admixture is Spanish. A little bit of Portuguese and other Europeans, tiny little bit of Sephardic. We're down to now about sixty per million. If we assume that this is Lamanite DNA but the tract analysis tells us that this is Sephardic DNA. So essentially we can say, after all of the work that's been done in South America, they can't detect indigenous. So they cannot detect um, putative or potential Lamanite DNA. <clears throat> if we turn to the, the church response to the, uh, the DNA, um, it's more than likely that DNA, uh, the DNA evidence uh, 
pressured the church to change the introduction to the Book of Mormon. So they're shifting away from the principal ancestors to being among the ancestors of American Indians. I would argue that this introduction to the Book of Mormon is entirely consistent with the Book of Mormon itself and everything that Joseph Smith ever said about the Book of Mormon. Um, but this is now, uh, the church is now um, retreating to this position. Um, in 2014, the church published the DNA essay. I just want to quickly run through and respond to some of the, um, you could spend an hour on the essay, but I just wanted to, to respond to some of the major points. Um, this first claim is just so tiresome. We see this all the time from apologists. Um, science is always changing, so we never really know anything. Um, but there has been a scientific consensus about the ancestry of Indigenous Americans for 100 years. Um, we're learning little bits more and more and more, and it's becoming more and more refined, but the essential story has not changed in that time. Um, the DNA essay does admit that uh, Native American DNA is largely Asian, and DNA hasn't, and uh, Lehigh DNA hasn't been found. Um, to be fair to the those who wrote the essay, the essay was written when they were only looking at the mitochondrial DNA, but the mitochondrial, sorry, the the uh, genomic DNA shows that we can clearly, de we easily detect um, very small traces of of you know, ancestral groups to Native Americans, um, but we find no evidence of what were very significant Lehigh populations. It also makes the claim that we don't know what Lehigh DNA looks like. We don't actually need to know what Lehigh DNA looks like. The main thing is we know it's not Asian. It would be Middle Eastern DNA and there's no sign of pre-Columbian Middle Eastern DNA in the Americas. It also claims that Lehigh DNA is, has been lost. It could have been lost due to bottlenecks, admixture, lots of other, uh, lots of other reasons. Uh, but this creates significant issues because the Book of Mormon was written to the Lamanites. And if we can't locate them, then it def essentially defeats the purpose. Um, the focus on limitations of the technology is just um, given how widely now genomic DNA is used for tracing ancestry, um, it's hard to see, um, it's hard to defend this claim that the technology has, so has enormous limitations. I want to just talk briefly about one of these claims that annoys me the most, probably this one that, that science is always changing. Uh, and this is a uh, a claim that was made in a National Geographic story um, back in 2014. Now, I should point out National Geographic is not a scientific magazine. It's a, a popular science magazine. There's a huge difference. Um, so it may have been a great surprise to the journalist that was writing this article that a third of Native American genes come from Eurasia or Western Eurasia. Um, but it wasn't a, a huge surprise to scientists. scientists. Scientists have known for a number of years, for many, many years, that um, uh, Indigenous Americans carry Eurasian DNA and some of that DNA came from Western Eurasia 30,000 years ago. Because the individual that was studied, this MA1 individual, which was the subject of that study, um, the DNA was from a 24,000 year old Siberian. Um, so that and what, this is what that study showed, that this individual had very close ties to Indigenous Americans and loose ties to many populations up in the high latitudes. Um, so the paper in question was looking at ancestry connections 25,000 to 30,000 years ago and was completely irrelevant uh, to the Book of Mormon period. Uh, I don't want to dwell too long on this. Um, Book of Mormon apologetics drives me crazy. Uh, but one of these, um, one of the approaches they have taken is to, is to reinterpret what the, the word Lamanite means. Uh, and this claim here from Sorensen is just completely ridiculous. Um, it could also refer to basically everyone. So essentially anyone, everyone's a, a Lamanite. 
So the term becomes almost meaningless. Um, Meldrum and Stevens even likened it to a meme. So if you had a distant ancestor that had just sort of mixed with a genetic Lamanite, they would then become a, a Lamanite. Um, fam familial terms that were common, like the, the, for a thousand years, the Lamanites and Nephites referred to each other as their brethren, their descendants, their seed, their children. But no, they, uh, according to Roper, these were adopted Lamanites. They weren't genetic Lamanites. But what about all the statements by God in the Doctrine and Covenants and the ones made by Joseph Smith? According to Roper, they're just the opinions of the prophet. They don't really matter. Um, I just find it hard to pay, take these guys seriously because they don't, have, they don't talk for the prophet. They don't have any authority. They don't, um, if we start hearing the prophets say these things, then we can maybe pay attention. Uh, I'll skip over this, but there are many textual problems with all of the apologetics. Um, and not the least of which is the book makes no mention of vast populations that surrounded the Nephites or the Mulekites and Jaredites. They must have run into these unmentionable native people. Um, so, yeah, there's just enormous problems with this apologetics. Um, one thing that continually frustrates me is that Fair Mormon just perpetuates lies. Um, there were false claims were made by Keith Crandall back in the Book of Mormon DNA, Book of Mormon and UL DNA DVD that was produced in 2008. He claims that there was Middle Eastern DNA found in the Mayan population as opposed to across North and South America. Um, and then he ridicules population, the uh, critics like myself, who he claims don't understand popular gen population genetics. It's a very tricky kind of data. Well, it turns out that Keith Candle himself was tricked by the data and he's referring what he's referring to as Middle Eastern DNA is in fact European DNA. And as the genomic studies have shown, it's all uh, vast, the majority of the uh, European DNA in indigenous Americans is Spanish and Portuguese and the tiny proportions of Jewish DNA uh, came in after Columbus. So it, it just annoys me that this sort of stuff is still produced. I've complained to Keith Crandall um, I'm not even sure if he's a member of the church anymore or attends anymore. He left BYU several, a couple of years after making these claims and I haven't heard from him since. So where to from here? Just to summarise the science, um, genomic DNA can easily detect traces of ancient ancestry in both Polynesians and Indigenous Americans, but it has failed to find any trace of pre-Columbian ancestry in in both of these groups. Um, they are not descended from Mormonism's Lamanites and these facts are not gonna go away. Um, somebody's not gonna turn around in five years time and suddenly find uh, Middle Eastern DNA all throughout uh, the Americas. It looks like the church is beginning to distance itself from the apologetics. Uh, and I think this is largely because of social media. Apologetics went on for many years in the background and people didn't see it. But in uh, fairly recently, the church closed farms and sacked some of the apologists. And as recently as 2018, they've been encouraging people to come to the defense of the, the Book of Mormon, calling for independent voices. And so you now you've got um, Fair Mormon Interpreter, Book of Mormon Central, and even crazy uh, creation of pseudoscience from Rodney Meldrum's Heartland Group. Uh, so you've got to be careful what you call for when you ask for independent voices because you get all sorts of stuff. But it's nice to know that um, even the most ardent apologist, Stephen Smoot, is prepared to admit that um, you may be able to get into the celestial kingdom um, without believing in the historicity of the Book of Mormon. So maybe there's a chance for me. Um, I think the biggest problem we have at the moment is that uh, we have this catch-22 occurring at BYU in particular. Uh, the brethren believe the historicity. If you question the historicity, and you can see this all the time, we just saw this very brief recently with Brian Howglid when it comes to the Book of Abraham, if you question the historicity, you then uh, put at risk your membership, your status and your salary. And so the historicity is still continually defended. <clears throat> 
and I don't think we're ever going to break out of this cycle um, anytime soon. Maybe we will. There has been a bit of a tendency for the church to back away from um, uh, apologi- back away from discipline for for uh, expressing or questioning the historicity. Uh, it was refreshing to hear uh, Greg Prince um, talk recently. Um, Greg believes the Book of Mormon is a 19th century document and he, in his view, the church is quietly starting to downplay the ancientness paradigm and, and promoting its, uh, the spiritual values of the book. Um, but it remains to be seen if this approach is going to be sustainable. Um, I think it's fair to say that most people that are going through a faith crisis find it difficult to accept nuanced views. From my opinion, looking back over 20 years, uh, there's not too many people hang on to the newest nuanced views for terribly long. Um, I think they're going to be more popular amongst Mormon academics. Uh, this view that it's, it's not history, but it's of, of spiritual value and more used for Utah Mormons, but less useful for less uh, satisfying for those uh, at greater distance. I think the bigger problem though, is that the Book of Mormon has been used to erase indigenous culture for many years. And these are some powerful quotes from uh, indigenous Americans and a Polynesian reflecting on their membership of the church and the influence the Book of Mormons had. Um, I would strongly uh, encourage people that are interested in this to look at, to read uh, Decolonizing Mormonism by Gina Colvin and Joanna Brooks, which looks very closely at uh, the how Mormon culture has erased indigenous culture and how we need to move beyond this. But there are also uh, considerable problems that need uh, in within the Book of Mormon that need erasing, and that's these sort of scriptures. Uh, this is just racist, completely and utterly racist. I don't care what sort of apologet the, the, the apologetics uh, attempts to erase this. Uh, to to, to uh, explain away the scriptures are just woeful. Um, they're just 19th century racism that's found its way into the Book of Mormon and need need a raising as well. But this is a, a major challenge for the church. And while I'm at it, I should, I'd like to mention, uh, 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 to point people towards Sarah Newcomb's talk on Manifest Des- Destiny because... Um, the Book of Mormon really has an awful lot of, in, uh, of the Book of Mormon supports manifest destiny. This idea that the U.S. is God's chosen land, um, and the Constitution is inspired by God, um, and uh, that's going to be increasing. It's going to be really difficult to extract that uh, the the church from that. Um, so I think on that point, I'll conclude and acknowledge just some of the contributors to the work here, in particular the the folk at uh, Signature Books and also Thomas Murphy and uh, Gary Edmund in the University of New South Wales who's helped um, with some of uh, my recent work and of course my wife Jane who suffers with my obsession with this. Thank you. Hey Simon, uh, great. Um... We're, we're about out of time and there were some questions, but I'll, I'll go through some of these you already answered. So okay. uh, a lot of more very complimentary on the presentation. And I'd encourage anyone that if we don't get your question answered here to go on to the community chat and post some questions for Simon. Um, here's one. I've heard about X2A DNA discovered in the Great Lakes and Middle East areas. Is this valid? What is your understanding? I did have one extra slide and I'm going to click down to it. Okay. The X2A DNA is pre is ancient. Okay. These are claims made by Rodney Meldrum and his heartland group. Rodney Meldrum's a creationist and he sees everything through a 6,000 year old world and all of his claims about the DNA are wrong. Um, so, the X2 DNA came into the Americas with the very first American, first Americans. I did have a few extra slides about this, but um, when I showed this slide earlier, it, the X2 DNA is just as old 
And this shows the, the heartland people doing some excavations. Uh, but yeah, now Rodney Meldrum, all of his claims are completely suspect. He has no scientific training. And that's why I didn't really address his work um, okay. because it just has, it's just, just crazy. So uh, maybe just one more question. What are the implications of recent discoveries of Mexico DNA 30,000 years ago as it relates to Native American genome? You kind of touched on that early on. But yeah, yeah I think I'm that? pretty convinced that that's... Um, the scientists that published the very recent work don't draw any, any link between that work on the 30,000-year-old Mexican and the Australasian DNA in, the, in South America that I mentioned. Um, but I'm, and I think that's because it's, it, they just didn't have any firm evidence to link the two. They don't have any DNA from the Mexican. Uh, in fact, they don't have any human remains that survived um, from that Mexican site. But uh, I'm almost convinced that what happened is you had a wave of, of um, essentially the Clovis group, huge populations of indigenous Americans moving south around about 15,000 years ago. And they just absorbed the, um, the groups that were there. And so there were tiny traces of that Australasian DNA in Mesoamerica, um, mostly in Central uh, South America. Okay. Uh, one more, only one quick one. On the map slide, what does Kaya mean? K-Y-A. Oh, KYA, that's a thousand years ago. Oh, okay, a thousand years ago. Okay. Yeah, sorry, sometimes yeah. I use BP and sometimes KYA. Sorry, yeah, so. Okay. <clears throat> well, thanks, Simon. We're, we're out of time. So, uh, okay. everyone, thanks for, for coming to the presentation. It was very well accepted. Uh, great information, Simon. Hope, to, hope you'll continue to publish this and uh, hope to see you on the chat boards. Uh, with the conference and thanks again for your time Simon. Oh you're welcome Brett, thank you. Thanks for attending. Great. Thanks. <laughs>